This episode contains references to suicide and domestic violence, so it may not be suitable for everyone. When Edward Leo Carvery was a boy, it seemed to him that he was living in the Garden of Eden. The happy feel I knew was like a haven. It was beautiful. I mean, when I grew up in Africa, we used to go into the woods and we'd pick berries, wild pears, blueberries. We'd hunt old apple trees. It was paradise. And then on the other side of the road, of course, it was the Atlantic Ocean, the Bedford Basin. And that was a tool we used not only for recreation, but we also fished in the Bedford Basin. It was a livelihood to a lot of us Africvillians. Africville was the heart of Halifax's black community. When Duke Ellington or Joe Lewis would come to Nova Scotia, that's where they'd go stay. The residents were mostly poor, but they took pride in their homes and their self-sufficient way of life. It was a lot of poverty, but there was so much love. There was so much community. That's not how the rest of Halifax viewed Africville. To them, it was a blight on the city, an embarrassment. There were no paved roads, no sewage system, no running water. The city dump was in Africville, and newspapers and radio broadcasts ran stories expressing shock that Africvillians would search through the dump for items to sell. Thursday was sunny, and 14 men were able to scavenge on the city dump. They did not seem to be distracted by the eight or ten boys and girls scrambling over the huge piles of waste and quarreling over sticks, rags, and old picture frames. Eddie was one of the kids who worked in that dump. Here's a much younger Eddie Carvery talking to a reporter about it. I think the majority of the people from Africa felt the dump was a blessing. Because through the dump, we were able to get the materials that we couldn't afford to buy. Anything salvageable, we used to salvage and uh, sell back to the city. As Eddie grew older, the city of Halifax convinced itself that it had to do something about Africville. They claimed that the conditions were unlivable. And in the 1960s, Halifax began to destroy Africville one house at a time. You'd wake up in the morning and one of the houses wouldn't be there. One of the families wouldn't be there. Uh, and that's just continued until they were all gone. Eddie watched as his friends and family and neighbors all had their houses torn down and they were mostly moved into public housing. Eddie's family was carted out of Africville as well. Here's Daisy Carvery, Eddie's mother, talking to a reporter in the 1970s. We were threatened. They put threats on our heads. If you don't move at a certain time, we'll bring out the bulldozers and push us over, push your shacks over. They brought us in more or less like you would herd in a bunch of cattle. Brought us in the city. They took out their city dumps, trucks. This was a complete disgrace. The city disgraced themselves. This is the only place in the world that you would send an old working dump truck to move children, mothers, and families into a city. The Carveries lived in public housing. His mother had to rely on welfare for the first time in her life. And young Eddie became consumed with rage. I had put in my mind that I would try to blow City Hall up because I felt that the council of that day were evil, they were racist, and they destroyed my community. That's what mindset I had. But my mother got wind of my thoughts, and she straightened me out, buddy. My mother sent me down and she said, Eddie, if you want to do something, then you'll go back out to Africa, and you'll lay on the ground, and you'll start a protest. And you'll stay there and help people listen. And I took her advice. I went out and I laid her on the ground. Eddie went back to the ruins of Africville, and he stayed there. At first, he thought he would only have to stay there for a short while until people realized the wrong that had been committed. But that didn't happen. And the days turned into weeks, the weeks into months, the months into years. And those years 
turned into decades. In fact, Eddie Carvery never really left. He's the last man in Africville, and he's been there protesting for half a century. Fifty years ago, a community of 400 black Nova Scotians was erased from the map. Their homes and most valued institutions were bulldozed, and their entire way of life was destroyed. Ever since then, one man has fought to make sure that Africville isn't forgotten. Eddie Carvery may not have been the best man for the job, but he has never stopped fighting for his home. I'm Archie Mann, and from Canada Land, this is Commons. Growing up in Halifax, I knew of the legend of Eddie Carver. He was just a presence, and he had a pretty fierce reputation as, as somebody, you know, a little unhinged, maybe a little prone to violence, and he was often called a squatter, and it was kind of made out in the media, particularly as though he was squatting there. That was the word that was used a lot. That's John Tatry. He's a Halifax-based journalist who wrote a book about the life of Eddie Carvery called The Hermit of Africville. John met Eddie for the first time in 2008. He was covering the annual Africville reunion for a local paper. And as I was interviewing a man called Dizzy Brown, who was the last person born in Africville, Eddie wandered over and just started talking to me. And uh, so I asked his take on a few things and he spoke and I kind of knew who he was. He was a very distinctive looking person. But I'd never heard him speak before, and I was just blown away. I just He was so passionate, so powerful. It sounded like he was speaking to an audience of 100,000 people, not just me with my little recorder. Just instantly, I knew that I wanted to write his book, and he was on board with me writing his book right away. Eddie has that kind of effect on people. He's able to inspire a passion for his lost home of Africville in just about everyone. Today, what was once Africville is a small oceanside park. You look on a map of Canada, you see Nova Scotia is that sort of lobster peninsula just attached to the mainland. And then if you zoom in, you see Halifax, downtown Halifax is a peninsula attached to mainland Nova Scotia. And in the very north end of the peninsula was Africville, right on the shores of the Bedford Basin. So Halifax was built up kind of in the main city center area, Grand Prix, Town Hall, that sort of thing, where, where the ships come in, the sort of main tourism area still today. Africa was always beyond that, just north of the north end. But the history of that place goes back hundreds of years. Africville was one of the oldest black settlements in Canada. And there are oral histories tracing it back to the founding of Halifax in 1749. There are certainly uh, records of black people in Halifax in those early days. There's records of slave auctions being held in, in Grand Prairie, Halifax, but also of freed slaves, former slaves, and other black people who had just arrived by other means. And they had helped build the, the original city, dig the streets. Some of the first settlers were Maroons from Jamaica, communities of escaped slaves that would raid plantations and fight the British authorities. Some were expelled from Jamaica and given land in Nova Scotia. Others were black loyalists who came to Halifax in the aftermath of the American War of Independence. Africville is more famous for its ending than its beginning or its, its life, really. And so it's often portrayed, even still, as a, an impoverished community or as a sort of a community grown up around a dump or something like that. But Africville was prosperous for, for a long time. Africvillians farmed and fished. They worked as nannies for white Haligonians or as porters on the rail lines. They developed their own institutions, and black families from across Nova Scotia flocked to the community. By the middle of the 20th century, there were around 400 people living in Africville, from about 80 families. There was a small schoolhouse and a church, and the people of Africville were proud that they owned their own homes. Here's Joseph Skinner, an Africvillian, speaking to a reporter in the 1960s. When you're in this country and you own a piece of property, you're not a second-class citizen. That's why my people own this land. They work for it, they toil for it, and they work to get this little piece of land that they own, and they try to hang on it. But when your land is being taken away from you, you ain't offered nothing, then you become a peasant in any man's country. But going back all the way to the 1800s, it's clear that the establishment in Halifax thought of Africville as an undesirable place. 
every time there was an unpleasant structure that needed to be put somewhere, it somehow always ended up in Africville. The city built Rockhead Prison just above the community, and then there was the Infectious Disease Hospital. Well, they put that atop our community also, and the septic tank happened to come out in the pond in our community where we swam, and we all got very sick from that. But 1906 is another key year. That's the first time Halifax City Council starts talking about relocating Africville, of uh, removing it in some way, declaring it industrial land was the first, first goal. The divide was deepened by the Halifax explosion in 1917, which obliterated much of the north end of the city. The north end is completely wiped out. It's, it's devastating. 2,000 people killed, 10,000 injured in a city of 50,000 people, just flattened to the ground. You, you can look at the pictures and you can see the devastation. But because Africville is nestled behind a hill, it was largely spared. Over the next many years, huge sums of public money flowed into Halifax for the rebuilding. But none of that found its way to Africville. After the Halifax explosion, the whole north end was done over. They took our farms and they started building houses, but not for us people in Africville. The pavement stopped where Africville started. And really, from that point, it's almost like it's left to starve to death. Like they cut off the, the support systems and just wait and let it breathe on its own as long as it will. And kind of to everyone's surprise, Africville keeps breathing, keeps enduring. While well, other Haligonians had access to city services like plumbing, sewage, paved roads, Africvillians had to get by on their own, even though they paid taxes just like everyone else. It didn't just start like overnight. It was a matter of years of what they did to us people of Africville to soften us up so they could, so they could literally steal our community because that's what they did. And of course, there was the dump. But then in the 1950s, it's kind of into the death throes, and that's when the dump is put on Africville. And of course, people saw it as such an insult. You can, you can imagine, what does your city think of you? Here's the town dump. And there was more explicit violence that was perpetrated against Africvillians. The Halifax police would come into the community to shoot dogs that were barking too loud for the liking of the white people who lived up on the hill. Of course, they never asked if the dogs belonged to anyone. And in one especially horrifying incident, some workers who went to drop off things in the dump announced to the locals that they were throwing out some old alcohol, but that it was still drinkable. Africvillians availed themselves of the free booze, but it was only the next day when people started retching and going blind that they realized it had been wood alcohol. The people who poisoned Africville faced no consequences. And ironically, all of these things the city was doing to Africville became the justification for destroying it. By the 60s, a consensus was developing amongst the political class of Halifax that Africville simply had to go for the good of its own residents. Here's the mayor of Halifax at the time, John Edward Lloyd. Africville obviously must be redeveloped, and sometimes some people need to be shown that certain things are not in their own best interests and not in the best interests of their children. You want to take these projects, certainly, by persuasion to, rather, certainly you don't coerce people against their will, but uh, should there be violations of minimum standards, then you have no alternative but to enforce the law, and this is universal for everybody. The level of contempt of talking down as though they're not even children, like I wouldn't even talk to my children like that, it's clear today that the real reason Halifax wanted to get rid of Africville had little to do with the welfare of the black residents. It was about discomfort. For a long time, a lot of people in Halifax, a lot of white people felt uncomfortable having this semi-independent black community right on their doorstep and one that had at times been quite prosperous despite efforts to, to reduce it. And finally, you know, it was just like enough is enough. Now is the time to get rid of it. Africvillians had been petitioning the city to upgrade their services. They wanted the same amenities that other Haligonians had access to. But it was estimated they would cost around $800,000 to make those upgrades. And the politicians decided that this was simply too expensive. 
So we always had this veneer of urban renewal, which was this idea that you should clear out slums and replace them with better housing. So it would sound like a good idea. And one of the lines that you heard all the time was home for a home, a home for a home. Afric Villians were promised $500 and a new home if they left. But the city didn't give them any choice. The residents felt like they were under siege. When someone agreed to move or be moved, then that same day they tore their house down. That's Archie Dixon speaking about the demolitions at a public meeting. So when you woke up the next day and looked around, you found that uh, Mrs. Brown's house over there was no longer there. And that really, uh, well, that had a psychological effect upon people too. So this was the method which they used. And when you find yourself, uh, you know, all the desolation all around you, it sort of softens you up to decide when you might as well move too as well. And here's Eddie's brother, Irvine Carvery. We used to have a little, it was a little shed that no one used anymore. But us young guys, we used to use it as a hangout sort of place where we went and hung out. And we used to sometimes spend the night there. And I remember this morning we were in there and a bulldozer was coming through it and the wall was coming down and we were able to get out. Now that was my first real experience with relocation. Now we could have been killed. We were lucky to be able to get out of there. They didn't check in there to see if there was anybody in there. They just assumed. The heart of the community was the Seaview Africville Church. Our church was wonderful. People came from all over just to attend the services. You know, it was so spiritual. God was so real. And they used to line the roads. When we baptized, the roads used to be lined. The fields was people. And it was so joyous living in Africville. Even as people's homes were destroyed, the church remained. But eventually, it too had to go. The last service took place on Easter Sunday, 1967. And then one night the church was there and the next day that was gone. The bulldozers came for the Seaview Church in the dead of night. And it was just a bunch of rubble. And I, I stood there and I looked around me and I felt so empty, so hurt, just like, I don't know, it was a horrible feeling. Halifax spent $800,000 to demolish Africville, exactly what the city had estimated it would cost to give the residents access to proper city services. Do you think the Negro people get an even break in this city? Yes. No discrimination? No discrimination. A few years back, there was discrimination. Today, you take the places around. I think, generally speaking, a colored person can go anywhere in this city just as you can. I think so. You don't hear tell them being molested or anything like in the States or anything. Even in the 1960s, Halifax thought of itself as an enlightened city where black and white residents were afforded the same opportunities. But Eddie Carvery learned early on that that was a lie. Well, we had our own school at one time, and uh, the city decided they couldn't afford to give us a school teacher, and so uh, we were forced to integrate into the city school system. He had been a good student up to that point, but things changed quickly when he attended his new school. So I went to Margaret Park School, and my teacher, Mrs. Beck, decided that I would stay in her classroom and she would abuse me, and which she did for the whole time I was in Margaret Park. That woman had me in her classroom and she used to literally torture me and she used to literally call me names and degrade me and tell the rest of the kids, don't be around me, I was contagious. And she did that to me. And every evening at 4 o'clock, she used to take me to the principal. They used to take turns, and they used to beat me. I'm sorry, I, I still get very emotional when I talk about that. But when I was in grade 3, I thought I had a, a good opportunity in school. But this woman, Miss Beck, she took that from me. His schooling was Eddie's first brush with racism, but it was far from his last. When Eddie was still young, 
His older brother Raymond was scavenging in the dump one day when he was run over and killed by a dump truck driver. The driver faced no consequences. White people who hurt Africvillians rarely had to worry about that kind of thing. His father had been a kind man to that point, but after Raymond's death, something changed in him. He became violent and abusive. And as Eddie grew older, he himself began to seethe with anger. I think the, the, the physical violence that he watched of the houses being destroyed, coupled with you know, the violence he'd experienced in his childhood, lit a, a violent rage in him, just a furious, furious anger. Eddie was in his early 20s when he had to watch his mother, Daisy Carvery, be kicked out of her own home. And though, like all Africvillians, she was promised a home in return for the one the city had destroyed, she never got it. In fact, almost none of the Africvillians were able to actually purchase a home. We haven't even got enough to put down one payment for a home. Nothing. I'm living on welfare. I think a whole lot of us, when we came in this city, we had to go on welfare. When we lived in that city of Africville, you look in the records and see how many Africville people had to humble and come to the city for welfare. We were too independent. We didn't want it. We earned our own living, and we earned it the honest way. My mother, she was probably the, the greatest fighter that came out of Africville. She was like the mother in our community. The kids and I came to our house for her advice, and she was there for everybody. At church meetings, she would be there. She was a community leader. My mother was. My mother's stuff was put on the back of a dump truck, the same dump the truck they, they brought the garbage out and dumped on the Africa dump was the same trucks they used to move us into condemned housing, and that was our lot. And here's Eddie's brother, Irvine, speaking about where the Carveries had to live after they were kicked out of Africville. Africville was referred to as a ghetto. What would you call this? This is a ghetto. This, this In other here, words, this is a real ghetto. This think? is the real deal, the real thing. By that time, Eddie's rage had already started to get him into trouble. He drank too much and got into fights, and he harbored thoughts of doing something more radical. His mind is going to, I'm going to blow up the bridge. I'm going to blow up City Hall. I'm going to do something. I think he wanted to do something that they couldn't ignore and that they couldn't dismiss as, you know, a lost cause or something, something that would get people's attention. But it was Daisy that talked him out of it. She was the one who gave him the advice that would determine the rest of his life. But she said, why don't you just go out there and stay there, like pitch a tent in protest and stay there in Africville. And, and that's what he decides to do in the summer of uh, 1970. He goes out there, pitches his tent on the site of where his house used to be, and decides he's going to stay there until justice comes. When I first started the protest, well, it was extremely difficult for me because I was up like 19 going on 20. I was very young. The weather was really, really, really tough. I wasn't conditioned to lay on the ground every year in the winters. It wasn't the flashiest protest. It mostly consisted of Eddie just sleeping in a tent in Africville, a man existing in a place where the city deemed people should no longer be. I thought maybe after three months, people would get hip and uh, they would start to uh, make Africville a conversation, but that didn't happen. After the weather, what gave him the most trouble were the cops. They would come out all hours in the night with the lights and sirens and big, loud noisemakers. And they used to sort of like attack me. That continued for about three months. But other Haligonians also made their displeasure with this protest known to him. They would call me names and tell me I had no business doing that and I should be, you know, hung from the tree and all kinds of things, all kinds of negativity. But through it all, I wouldn't go away. I couldn't because the more determined they were, that made me even that much determined to stay, and I did. When he first started his protest, the remnants of his former community were still around him. Usually he's alone out there in the, in the early 1970s. Sometimes there's still city workers there, like dragging off the carcasses of the houses and, and burning them. And Eddie just fights that with every bit of his existence. He just will not accept that being the final verdict on Africville. 
and even while he slept in a tent in Africville, Eddie tried to have a bit of a normal life. Despite prevalent racism and hiring, he found a job as a sheet metal worker, but that didn't last. He was accepted into a program that would train him to be an organizer, which seemed like a promising path for a charismatic guy like Eddie. But that didn't work out either. That's because Eddie discovered speed, and he found that he liked it. A lot. I, uh, I started using drugs. It became very bad, and, uh, like, nothing was working. Nothing was working right for me. I had went from smoking pot to putting needles in my arm. Eddie became addicted to shooting speed. He would wander the city high for days, and he doesn't remember much of those years. But during that time, he was a violent man, including to the people he loved. Eddie got married and had children, and he admits today that he was abusive to his wife. He couldn't or wouldn't control his anger. He would binge on drugs, hurt the people around him, and then feel overcome with guilt. I had blown everything, and I was really mad at myself. And the whole nine yards, I was angry, I was hurt, I was confused. As far as I'm concerned, I had lost everything, and I felt that my life was over, and I, 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 uh, I missed the boat. I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something right. I wanted to make it right what I'd done. And the only thing he felt he could do to atone for his many sins was to continue his quiet vigil on the land of his ancestors. I wasn't the perfect guy for the job. I didn't ask for the job. But for once, I can do something right. For once, I can make up for these mistakes that I kept on making over and over again. And so that was my attempt of reconciliation with myself. He would do these awful, awful things, hurt these people who often the people who were most trying to, to help him. But then he would go back out to Africa. And, you know, he spent years in prison and then he'd go back out to Africa and out there at times, like just in a sleeping bag on the ground, at times in a tent, he'd be there in the winter. He would freeze pretty much solid and like have to break the ice off himself when he got up in the morning. But something about that was purifying for him. As the decade wore on, he continued to spiral into himself. I even, I went to suicide. I tried to commit suicide, okay. I was in a coma for a couple of weeks. I woke up and I walked out to the hospital and I have never looked back. I walked out to Africville and I laid on the ground and I stayed there and I did what I promised my mother I would do. It was never about me. I am the worst person for the job, but there was nobody else. By the early 1980s, a decade into his protest, few people even understood what Eddie was trying to do. Most thought he was just some kind of vagrant living in a tent. I don't think he ever told anyone he'd started his protest other than his mother. You know, he just went out there and did it. He would often recruit people. He would go about North End Halifax trying to fire people up. And most people just told him, you're crazy. You're not going to win. Like, what on earth are you talking about? You're trying to save Africa? Have a look. There's nothing there to save. It's been destroyed. If people thought about the destruction of Africa at all, it was as a kind of necessary evil. They were happy to kind of nurture this idea that it was a slum, it was a disgrace, whatever it was. If it was maybe overly brutal in how they did it, still, it, was, it needed to be done. It needed to be cleared out. I think the hope was that it would just be forgotten and fade out. Occasionally, people would join Eddie, including his brother Victor, but few took any interest. The conversation around Africville did eventually start to change. Some Africvillians began to organize an annual reunion picnic where the community once stood. And an organization was formed called the Africville Genealogy Society to try to preserve the memory of Africville and to pressure the government to make amends. The group was headed by Eddie's own brother, Irvine Carvery. Irvine Carvery, uh, he's still a well-known person here. He's a, he runs, runs for office. He's been the head of the school board, you know, an active member of the community. But he always took the inside track, and that's how he approached Africville, was to build the Genealogy Society, to push forward legal cases, to put Africville on the map, to change the way people taught it in schools, if it was taught at all. So he led from the inside this effort to reclaim Africville. But Eddie, he's just on fire all the time. And so for him, that looked like he got paid. That's Eddie's expression for anyone who 
well, it covers a lot of people, but he got paid. Eddie still sees the Genealogy Society as a pawn of the city of Halifax. They started a genealogy society to turn people away from the protest. They didn't want people to protest what happened. But the genealogy society did have some victories. 1989, they helped organize a conference that included both Africvillians and some of the Halifax politicians responsible for its destruction. That was memorialized in the documentary Remember Africville. I often said to newspapers who came and said that there was a slum. I resented it, and I still resent anyone who calls Africville a slum. Slum usually are people who are, are renters and, and a place where the homeowners won't keep the property up. But they were a proud people. Former Halifax Mayor Alan O'Brien also spoke at the conference. I don't think anyone should be proud of particularly, but I think that the total Halifax community was somewhat embarrassed by the degree of publicity about uh, so-called slum as part of the city. And so some action was uh, pushed on us by that particular feeling. It wasn't the return of Africville, but it was recognition. This was the first time many Africvillians had been able to speak directly to the city's politicians about their community and what had happened. The city eventually promised to rebuild the Africville church, but for years nothing happened. Instead, the former site of Africville, a place where the Halifax police had once come to shoot dogs at random, was turned into a dog park. It was mostly used by the white residents who lived up the hill. More and more meetings were held, but Eddie Carvery was an unwelcome presence at these kinds of events. Eddie believed that the Genealogy Society wasn't asking for enough. His demands were unequivocal. Put Africville back. Build homes for the Africvillians that had been displaced and provide them compensation. He'd show up at the meetings and get into arguments. And sometimes it was more than just arguments. And so he's at this meeting and he's up at the microphone giving his his spiel, and somebody starts heckling him from the back. And Eddie, short Eddie, barrel-chested Eddie, he squares up to him and without hesitation just socks him in the jaw, sends him flying, cameras are flying, the media's all there covering this thing, the mayor's there running for cover. It's just utter chaos. It was around this time that Eddie went to prison once again. He had attacked a partner of his. He turned himself into the police, and at his sentencing, he asked the judge to give him an even harsher punishment than what was being asked for. The judge obliged him. That prison term is definitely a turning point in his life, and that solitary confinement, as I say, that's that time where he realizes that even if he strips away everybody else in the world, he's still stuck with Eddie Carvery, and that's his problem. Uh, it forces him to confront that. It forces him to sober up. And, yeah, he emerges differently. Eddie renounced violence and began to start making amends to the people around him that he hurt. But one thing didn't change. Even decades after he had started it, he was still committed to his solitary protest. And I know I got a bad record, but them people that had the good records, them lawyers and all them their doctors and everybody had the good records. Nobody was fighting the fight. And yeah, I was the loser. But I had the ability, and God gave me the courage and the strength to fight for my community the only way I knew how. The turning point in Eddie's protest came in 1995. That year, world leaders and the global press corps were descending on Halifax for the G7 meeting. Well, back at that time, there was this guy, uh, Bill Clinton. He was the president of the United States. He was coming over here to Canada. And he was coming here to Halifax, and I was in Africville, and I decided that it was time for the Africville protest to move down to the waterfront to welcome this president of the United States to let him know about what happened in Africville. By the time the G7 comes, a lot of the counselors, their fear is that the media will come cover this story, and then, you know, like people of old, they will hear about Africville, and they will go out and they will meet Eddie. And they don't want this to be what Halifax is known for. They don't want people talking to Eddie about Africville and the protest. So they decide to evict him from Africville. 
Halifax City Council passed a bylaw that would ban anyone from staying in a park overnight. It was specifically targeted at getting Eddie Carvery out of Africville. Still, in Halifax, if you see the signs on the park that say this park is closed from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., I like to think of that as the Eddie Carvery Memorial Bylaw. They created that bylaw to have grounds to kick him out of Africville. Eddie had to move, but he just stationed himself in a part of Africville that wasn't technically a city park, and the move only drew more attention to his protest. But he did get interviewed by the New York Times, and his story did resonate. And sometimes that's the way it goes in Halifax. Is it's not until outside media cover it that we're all kind of like, that's, that's how it looks to somebody coming at it with fresh eyes. We thought Africville was a slum that was cleared. And, and so I think it caused a lot of people in Halifax to think about it. And people were ready to re-examine Africville and ready to re-examine Eddie. Well, I didn't exactly miss my opportunity to see Bill Clinton and talk with him. But he knew where I was, and Halifax knew I was where I was. And so that was very important to me as recognition. Eddie's protest had finally helped bring the destruction of Africville back into the mainstream consciousness. But still, not much changed for years. The city was promising that a new church would be built, but it never came. Politicians were adamantly opposed to any kind of compensation. The city, uh, according to the records, paid everybody for uh, uh, their land they took in the uh, Africville area. That's Halifax Mayor Walter Fitzgerald speaking a few years after the G7 meeting. And it was all done without expropriation. So we do not owe anybody anything. The deal was made, was signed, sealed and delivered. People took their money and left. Game over as far as I'm concerned. The international community continued to pay attention to the inaction. A 2004 United Nations report blasted Canada for, among other past sins, the destruction of Africville and demanded reparations be paid. Eddie, by now, was getting older and weaker, and the protest was getting more and more dangerous for his health. There were times in the middle of the Halifax winter when his heat would go out and a friend of his would find him in the morning nearly frozen to death. The city towed his camper, so Eddie found a job in the city, bought a new camper, and then the city towed it again. He suffered debilitating heart attacks that would put him in the hospital. When he returned to Africville, his trailer and all of his belongings would be gone, so he'd have to start from scratch once again. As Eddie's profile grew, so did the harassment, including from white power groups. They'd show up in their cars, or even they'd Traveling groups of 13 or 15, they'd harass me. They got to the point where they would shoot live bullets at me, and uh, they'd come into my camp and destroy it. At one time, they really were committed, so they had their uniforms on, like KKK uniforms, and they marched through Africville, and they tried to scare me out. Through it all, Eddie kept up his vigil. And then, in 2010... 40 years after he began his protest, something happened. Mayor Peter Kelly, kind of out of the blue, I don't know if anybody really knows what prompted him in 2010 to talk about this, but he just kind of out of the blue says, we're going to have an apology for Africville and we're going to build a church. You lost your homes, your church, all the places in which you gathered with your family and friends to share and mark the milestones of your lives. For all of that, we apologize. Eddie is in the back, of course. He's not part of the inside. Irvin is inside. He's right at the front. He's got a chair there. He's invited to speak. And it's kind of like the event is over and somebody shouts out, let Eddie talk, let Eddie talk. You know, we're like, oh boy, what's going to happen now? Eddie, you know, it's just the wild card always when Eddie's involved. And Irvin Carvery, you know, just a beautiful moment, offers up his own seat to Eddie and says, come up here and take, take my place up here, and gives Eddie the microphone. And Eddie makes this speech and just gives the whole, you know, this is what Africville is about for me. And this time he is cheered. You know, it's this community organizer that he wanted to be in the start for this wonderful moment. He has his community here listening to him. And Reverend Britton, the, the prominent minister in Halifax of New Horizon Church, says, and you won, and you won. She just keeps repeating that. And it's like, 
that Eddie can't quite hear that. And I still don't think Eddie's quite ready to hear that, that he won. I don't, and from his point of view, he hasn't won. He's maybe got the first victory, but there's more work to do. The apology, was it real? Was it genuine? I don't think so. I mean, we never did get sidewalks. We had an old house out there. It was a brick building. Guess what they did? They took it. Now there's nothing out there for the use as a washing facility. There's not a telephone out there. There's absolutely nothing. They've, what they've done, they've created this lie and it's flying back in the face. And what must be told is the truth and the truth must come out. Eddie's protest continues to this day. He's still out there in Africville with no running water, no electricity. He's not just demanding compensation for the people like him whose homes were destroyed. He wants Africville back. He wants the city to rebuild what they had destroyed. I think we should be compensated. For 50 years loss of community, for our homes, we should have new homes. Our opportunity for to have our homes and our community was taken from us. Our opportunity for good jobs, which that land would have provided, was taken from us. Our pride as being Canadians was taken from us. We were left feeling disgraced, dishonored, humiliated, let down. It didn't take them 50 years to take my community. Surely somebody's in the position of authority where they will hear this voice and do something to correct this awful error that they thought was right. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. Make it right, put Africville back, do the right thing. I asked Eddie if he had any regrets about the lifelong protest. Have I got any regrets? Yeah, my regret is I didn't start sooner. I regret the fact that uh, I had such a miserable start. But as far as spending my life there, no, I don't regret that at all. As a matter of fact, Africa is still part of this conversation. Had not I laid on the ground all them years ago, I'm sure Appyville would not be in the conversation today. I like to think that what I did, even though it took me all my life, I like to think that it was important. I like to think that I did something to benefit all Canadians. If black lives do indeed matter, then Appyville should matter. If that being the case, put it back so we can be a part of the society. That was our gift to the world. That was our corner of the world. That was ours. We don't got to live in shacks. We can live in oceanfront homes. We can enjoy the beautiful Beverly Basin, just like our Caucasian brothers. But first, they got to put Africa back. We deserve that much. Until we get it, I'm in the face. I'm in Africa. I'm the protester. The Seaview Africville Church is now rebuilt, but today it's a museum, not an active place of worship. And to make way for it, Eddie was once again kicked out of his home in Africville, this time by the Africville Genealogy Society. I had a little host that stood there, and I also had a truck. And genealogy asked me would I leave my home so they could put their church there. And they made a deal that they would compensate me. And just like the city, after they took my house and after they took my car, guess what? They gave me nothing. Uh, I don't know what that means to anybody else, but that little house I built was my little house that I built out there. Genealogy wanted to put the church out there, so I gave up my house again a second time in Africa. They said, you know, your premises are unsightly. It doesn't look good. Your Africa protest trailer, how about you go and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put up a memorial of some sort for you. 
And January 2019 or so, that kind of looked like that might have been the end of the protest, that it had just sort of burned out. But it wasn't the end. Late that year, some of Eddie's supporters, including John, started a GoFundMe so that Eddie could buy a new trailer. But little money came in. And then, I think it was in May, uh, somebody called me and said, have you checked it out? And it just had blown through the roof. $17,000, $20,000, $25,000. We got up to $30,000 or so in just a couple of days. The killing of George Floyd and the massive protests across North America had caused many people in Halifax to re-examine their history of racism. And some of them came across the story of Eddie Carvery, the man who refused to let the world forget about Africville. Eddie was able to buy a new trailer with the money. He's still out there. He is still, he doesn't live at the protest anymore, but he goes out there every day. I thought I could do it for three months. Three months turned into over 50 years. I am so worn out and I am so tired and I am so blessed to be able to say, give it back. If it's my last breath, it's going to be give Africville back. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that episode, subscribe to this channel. And also consider subscribing to our main channel to find exclusive videos and behind the scenes content that you can't get anywhere else. And finally, we're an audience supported network. So if you care about the work that we do, become a supporter. You'll get access to new ad free episodes, discounts on our merch, tickets to live events, and so much more. Just go to canadaland.com slash join.